Good morning, and welcome to St. Ladislaus Parish. And a very special greeting to any visitors joining us for parish worship this morning. And if you haven't already done so, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. Thank you. We invite you now to take a moment to greet those sitting near you. Today, the church is celebrating the liturgy for the 27th Sunday in Ordinary Time. And before Mass begins, we have a few announcements to share with you. Our St. Lad's evangelization team is once again sponsoring St. Ladislaus apparel for purchase. Sample items are displayed in the atrium. Order forms are available at all exits and also in the bulletin. The deadline for orders is October 22nd. Proudly wear your St. Lad's clothing in our parish and in our community. Be bold, be Catholic. This weekend is St. Vincent de Paul's annual Blanket Sunday collection. You will find an envelope in today's bulletin for your consideration. Please return it next weekend at Mass. Thank you again and again for your continued support of this ministry. After Mass today, the Knights of Columbus are in the atrium selling football crazy tickets. It is an interesting fundraiser involving the NFL teams with all proceeds going to charity. Please stop and ask a night in the atrium. And thank you. Again today at Mass, immediately following our entrance song, we will present another liturgy lesson. Remember, you can find a summary of the lesson in today's bulletin, as well as information to access it online. Thank you for your kind attention. Presiding at the Mass today will be our pastor, Father Donald Snyder. Assisting at the Mass today will be, be Deacon John Travis. Mass will begin in a moment. Before it does, we are invited to quiet ourselves for this time of prayer and worship. Being blessed with God's word, we gather together to sing number four, two, three. I sing the mighty power of God. That's number 423. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise. That spread the flowing seas abroad and build the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command and all the stars obey. I sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed wherever I turn my eye. If I survey the ground I tread, or gaze upon the sky. There's, There's not, not a, a plant, plant or flower below that makes thy glories known. And clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. Well, all that borrows life from thee is ever in thy care, and everywhere that I can be, thou God art present there. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may the Lord be with you all. 
As we announced at the beginning, I'd invite you for a moment to be seated for a, a lesson on our liturgy that calls us to be a people engaged and to realize the presence and the God whom we worship at this liturgy. When I was a newly ordained priest, a woman in the parish came to me and as mad as could be about active participation. And she said to me, active participation, active participation, all this business about active participation since Vatican II. Now I wasn't smart enough at the time to realize that active participation is a term that was invented by Pope Pius X in 1903, a full 60 years before Vatican II ever used the term. So what is active participation? Where does it come from and what does it mean? The context for Pius X's understanding of active participation is a document that he issued in November of 1903 on the restoration of Gregorian chant in the liturgy. Here's what he says in that document. We deem it necessary to provide before anything else for the sanctity and the dignity of the temple in which the faithful assemble for no other object than that of acquiring the spirit from its foremost and indispensable font, which is the active participation in the most holy mysteries and in the public and solemn prayer of the church. Since the time of Pius X's writings, the church has been inspired by this idea of active participation, but we should give some nuance to the term. Because in English, the word active leads us to believe that we should be doing things. And while we should be doing things, there's a deeper meaning to this. So Pius X writes this document originally in Italian. And the Italian word he uses here is attiva, which is akin to attain. So perhaps the idea is that we attain deeper participation in the liturgy. When it's translated into Latin, the term becomes actuosa, which is related to actualize. And so perhaps it suggests the nuance that our participation in the liturgy should be actual or real or fully realized. So 60 years later, after the document of St. Pius X, the church weaves this notion of active participation into the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, adding to it the notion of full and conscious. This idea of active participation, in a sense, becomes the battle cry for liturgical renewal in the church. And so it doesn't mean that simply that we do things, but that we should be engaged fully from the inside out, understanding what we are doing, fully aware of the beauty and the richness there. So with this notion of participation in the liturgy, it's really important that we understand that first and foremost, the participation must be interior. And in fact, sometimes we can't see on the outside whether someone is actually participating in the liturgy. I often think of people at funerals, a grieving family, for example, who perhaps can't bring themselves to sing the songs that others are singing. But at the same time, you can't say that they're not fully engaged in what's going on. Perhaps, in fact, they're letting the participation, the external participation of others, carry them through this deep moment of grief. When we're participating in the liturgy, we realize that, in fact, we are participating in Christ's own prayer of praise to His Father. We pray in the liturgy almost as if we were on the Lord's shirt tails, offering with Christ ourselves totally and completely to God the Father. If we were able to do that, our participation in the liturgy would be full and conscious and active.
So we gather with renewed hearts, our attitudes to call us to realize, to recognize, to be conscious of the God whom we worship here, the God who has blessed us, the God who has bestowed forgiveness. So aware of that presence of God and responding in love, let us prepare ourselves to celebrate this Eucharist. Lord Jesus, you raise us to new life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you forgive us our sins. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you feed us with your body and blood. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us. May God forgive us our sins and bring us to life everlasting. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God, glory to God and honor. Peace to people of good will. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. Glory to God in the highest, glory to God in the highest, glory to God, glory to God and on earth, peace to people of goodwill. Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God. Let us bow our hearts even as we open our hearts to the coming and the presence of our God. Almighty and eternal God, it is out of your abundance of kindness that surpasses all our desires, and you call us to come to you. So pour out your mercy upon us, pardon any sin and give what our prayer does not even dare to ask. We pray all this through Christ our Lord. A reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a suitable partner for him. So the Lord God formed out of the ground various wild animals and various birds of the air, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. 
whatever the man called each of them would be its name. The man gave names to all the cattle, all the birds of the air, and all wild animals, but none proved to be a suitable partner for the man. So the Lord God cast a deep sleep on the man, and while he was asleep, he took out one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. The Lord God then built into a woman the rib that he had taken from the man. When he brought her to the man, the man said, This one, at last, is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of her man this one has been taken. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two of them become one flesh. The word of the Lord. reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, he for a little while was made lower than the angels, that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, 
for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the leader to their salvation perfect through suffering. He who consecrates and those who are being consecrated all have one origin. Therefore, he is not ashamed to call them brothers. The word of the Lord. God bless you, sir. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Help us share the good news of your love. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. The Pharisees approached Jesus and asked, is it lawful for a husband to divorce his wife? They were testing him. He said to them in reply, What did Moses command you? They replied, Moses permitted a husband to write a bill of divorce and dismiss her. But Jesus told them, Because of the hardness of your hearts, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, no human being must separate. In the house, the disciples again questioned Jesus about this. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her, and if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And people were bringing children to him that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he became indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not prevent them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Amen, I say to you, whoever does not accept the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it. Then he embraced them and blessed them, placing his hands on them. The Gospel of the Lord. When I was reading over the scriptures for this Sunday during the week, I, I found it really hard to find a consistent thread that would link them. They seemed each in their own way to give me a good lesson, a good teaching, a, a nice thought. But to try to link them together, to find a common thread woven through them was difficult. I reread them again, and there were some kinds of things that happened. Because the first reading from the beginning of the scriptures, Genesis, talked about creation, especially the creation of all of us, men and women. And then the second reading, Paul, he is writing to the people, the Hebrews. And in there, he is saying that God, Christ, became one with us and indeed was pleased to call us brothers and sisters, so identifying with us. And then the final, the gospel you heard Deacon John just proclaim, spoke about the unity that was to mark any marriage. And then the ending of that, surprisingly tacked on, is a story about children and how we should adopt the attitude 
of children in our love for others and our dependence on our God and our mutual respect for each other. So going through them again, what do you see? What became a little clearer to me was the idea that in these readings is an outline, a suggestion. It is what God expects in our relationships with one another, what God expects in the way we treat one another. And that gave me an insight because I remembered so many conversations I've had with parishioners who often say to me, I don't know what to do. I'm having a really difficult time. I am struggling with my patience with this one. Now that can be a spouse, a friend, a, a co-worker, a, someone on the street, someone I'm acquainted with. I'm having a hard time and I find growing within me a resentment and even showing anger toward them. And then we began to talk in these conversations, not so much about the individual, but I posed the question first, what do you think this individual expects of you? And what are you expecting of this individual? Now that changes the conversation because often my anger with people has less to do with them or me and much more about our expectations of each other. So I would suggest these readings give us a hint. And if your relationships between one another are frayed or broken, are somehow strained and angry, maybe it is because your expectations do not mirror those of God. One of them might be as my expectations are very unrealistic, unreasonable for this person this time. Think for it in its most obvious form, with children. I will not expect children to respond, to react, to be responsible as I would an adult. So I don't put on children an expectation they cannot meet, even though the expectation later in their life will be fine, desirable, and indeed normal. But for this person, at this time, they cannot follow that expectation. Now put that with your own relationships with adults. There are some adults who at this point in their life cannot do a normal thing or cannot meet an expectation I place upon them. And I get so frustrated because they can't. But maybe I need to take a step back and recognize what I'm asking is unreasonable. It could be also the other way around. I am equally frustrated because they are placing demands on me, expectations on me that I can't meet. I can't do all of this. It's impossible for me to do all of the things you expect, and I'm angry with you. It frays our relationship. It pulls us apart because the expectations at this time are unreasonable. That may be the first lesson. Look and see in your relationships, are those placed upon you or those you place on others unrealistic at this time? But there seems to be a second one, and that is if my expectations are not at all what God expects. They are not God's expectations of how I should act. They're more my, well, my demands, my agendas. Look again at that first reading, Genesis. It says there, it is not good that we are alone. We know that from psychology. We know that better from experience. One of the worst things we can do is isolate people. Why in prisons do they say solitary confinement as an added punishment to someone? Even with children, why do we say it's a time out, go in the corner, get away? That isolation is very understandable because what it does is it forces me to realize how much I value the relationship, how much I want to get back into the relationship. So I'm going to change my expectations. In that first reading, you and I have to look and say, the Lord is telling me here it is not good for us to be alone, separate. And what often I have done is I have not really respected this sense in which we could be one. And I have placed and I have done more demands. In fact, what I have done is I have said, I want you indeed to see me 
and all I need, but I will not recognize always or look and see what you need. In other words, my expectations have become self-centeredness. They become demands, not expectations. I have pushed you away, or you may have noticed some people have just moved away from you. Maybe it's because you haven't done what this first reading said. Maybe I haven't understood that it is not good that I push people away, that I make demands that are unrealistic, that I indeed separate myself from others, that I see my needs and I ignore yours. That's not God's expectation. I need to adjust mine if that's what's happening because they are demands, not expectations. They are expressions of self-centeredness, not one of unity. And then go to the second reading. It's Paul. He's talking to the Hebrews. There he is saying, I am one like you, and he even calls us brothers and sisters. So it is a reminder to you and me that there should be about us that same sense of humility, that I am not different than another. I am indeed recognizing you are a brother or a sister, but even more, you are a son. You are a daughter of the Lord. And in that, I should begin to see a, a mutuality. I should see there a sense in which we are growing together. But often what I do in my relationship is I try to control it, don't I? I try to get you to do what I want you to do. I try to manipulate it. Oh, I don't like to admit it. Now, I see that so clearly in others, don't I? When they're trying to get me to do something I may not want to do or feel as appropriate to do. But I have a hard time seeing it in myself. But I do it. I control it. I'm too proud to admit it. I need to be more humble in this relationship. Less controlling. Less trying to get its outcome for my benefit. I have to look and see that this isn't an expectation of God. This is a control in a, of mine. I'm trying to indeed manipulate you. And then finally, maybe my expectations are off kilter because I have forgotten what that gospel said. The Lord is telling the disciples what should mark a marriage is that sense of unity. But maybe breaking it down, what should mark it is a single focus that I have as the beloved, the source of my love. And I look and say, you are the reason I love. You are the reason I have life today because I love you and you give me life. And I have a mutuality. We share in this relationship, both in responsibility as in love. And once you lose that focus and that mutuality, whether it is in a marriage or in a deep friendship or companionship, then I already have lost the goodness of that relationship. Losing its focus puts it all on me. Losing that mutuality makes you serve me. And that destroys the relationship, doesn't it? It's not expectation then. When I have lost the focus or I have abandoned the mutuality and made it all about me, what happens is then I become the master and you the servant. And that's how I expect it. I expect you to serve me. That's how it should be. But that's not what this reading says. This is not God's expectation. And in short, at the end, he tells us, you should be like children, children who recognize their need of one another, children who respond in great love, and they will give away whatever they have. Have you ever given a child young a piece of paper, some crayons, and soon they will draw a picture? Do they keep that picture and put it on their wall? They give it to you, put it on the refrigerator, hang it up. They will give away their love. No wonder the Lord says, you should look at these children. And instead of trying to manipulate, trying to control, trying to determine and to lose focus, recognize your love always is to be out-centered, looking at the other. That's the expectations of the Lord in good, healthy relationships. So maybe you need to look at the scriptures again and see very clearly where you need to change the expectations that are off bounds, unreasonable. Or maybe you need to curb the relationships differently with expectations that are of God, not of your own. 
See if your expectations are not so much expectations, but demands, or expressions of control, or of lack of focus. Look today and see how these readings could help us revive or enliven relationships to be more in line with God's expectations. So together we use the words of our Apostles' Creed to profess what we know is true. I believe in God, the Father, Maker, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, who was conceived, born, suffered, was, died. He descended. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. So let us now bring our prayers to the Lord, prayers for ourselves and one another. church leaders and all those who minister. May they model commitment, service, and love for all God's people. For our civic leaders and elected officials, may they lead with wisdom, humility, and compassion. For the safety of all children and for those who defend the rights of the unborn, For married couples, may their days together be filled with love, faithfulness, and unity. For all those suffering from natural disasters, especially those in Indonesia, that those experiencing separation of relationships will find renewal with God's love. for the special intentions we now offer up in silence. For those who are suffering, especially Lynette Brummagen, Colin Bowser, Ginny Carr, Josephine Oshana, Barbara Knoll, Chris David Rolitsky, Ron Stevenson, Sarah Kalani, Francesco Costanzo, Kevin McManaman, Barbara Fagan, Robert Mater, Karen Kay, and Helen Smith. May they all be comforted, strengthened, and renewed in faith. And we pray for the faithfully departed, especially Richard Hendrickson, father of Judy Senish. We also pray in a special way for Anthony and Alberta Sharada. May they all be counted among God's holy men and women.
and hear these, the prayers of your people, and others silent, all offered in the name of Christ our Lord. We bring our hearts and minds together as we sing number six, four, or, or, I'm sorry, uh, four, seven, eight, love goes on. That's number four, seven, eight. May the Lord accept the sacrifice for the praise and glory for our good. Now, Lord, accept, we ask, this sacrificial gift brought about by your commands. And through this sacred mystery, which we celebrate with loving and dutiful service, graciously complete its sanctifying work by which we are indeed redeemed. We pray all this through Christ, our Lord. 
May the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Together let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, it is right and just that always and everywhere we give you thanks, Father most holy, through the beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your word, through whom you've made all things. It was Christ you sent a Savior and Redeemer, incarnate of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Fulfilling your will, Christ gained for you a holy people. He stretched out his hands. He endured his passion. So there broke the bonds of death, and made known manifest the resurrection. So in gratitude and joy, we lift our hearts. We sing your hymn of praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth of your glory, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Oh, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, Lord. Indeed, it is you who are the font of holiness. Now make holy our gifts. Send down your spirit like dew on these that they shall become for us the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time that he was betrayed, he entered willingly into his passion. He took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it, gave it to the disciples, and he said, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when the supper ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to the disciples, said to them, Take this, all of you, drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood. The blood of the new and everlasting covenant, this will be poured out for you, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. We proclaim, we proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, Father, we celebrate this memorial of Christ's death and resurrection and here offer you the bread of life, the chalice of our salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence, to minister to you, Humbly, then, we pray that our sharing, our partaking in the body and in the blood of Christ, we will be gathered together as one by the Holy Spirit. Remember your church spread throughout the world. Grant her the fullness of your charity. With Francis, our Pope, Nelson, our Bishop, the clergy, indeed, all who minister in your church. Remember, to our brothers, our sisters, who have fallen asleep in the hope of resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy, welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us. With Mary, the mother of God, her spouse Joseph, your apostles, Saint Ladislaus, indeed all the saints who have done your will throughout the ages, may we be co-heirs to that eternal life. May we praise you and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. 
Through him, with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory, all honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. 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 Now, formed by Scripture, taught by Christ, we dare to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, against us, and lead us now into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, all from every evil. Grant peace in our day, and your mercy keep us free of sin, safe from distress, as we await the blessed hope and coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom and the glory are now and forever. It was Christ who brought peace. May God's peace be with you all and with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Praise be to God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, happy and blessed those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word. We come to be nourished with the Eucharist as we join in singing number 370, Bread of Life, that's number 370. of life and cup of hope, we come as gift to you. Change our hearts, fill us with peace, transform our lives anew. Open our eyes so that we might see presence in one another, your life poured out in love today, unites us all in you. God, open 
Please join us in singing number 545, Sacred Silence. That's number 545. Gentle mother, 
God's pure vessel praying for me. Saints and angels, all in heaven, come and be with me. Sacred silence, Gentle water washing over me. Help me listen, Holy Spirit, come and speak to me. Let us join these many prayers together. Lord, grant that we who have celebrated, been refreshed and nourished by this sacrament we have received, be transformed in what we have shared and eaten. We pray this through Christ our Lord. I invite those who are taking communion to the elderly or the sick in nursing homes if they would come forward. From our table of plenty, take this bread of life. To ones who could not join us and still they hunger for the Lord's love and mercy. Assure them of God's love Remind them of God's care. Extend to them God's blessing. So go, feed the lambs of Christ. Hurricane Florence, as we know, has wrought a great deal of devastation. And uh, the Knights of Columbus are having a a football raffle, which uh, proceeds always go for good causes, but... Uh, a, a large portion of the proceeds from this football raffle will be going to the uh, people who have been adversely affected by Hurricane Florence. So they're selling tickets out in the atrium if you'd like to uh, buy some tickets and have a chance to win. There are 23 chances to win. Also, uh, in a similar vein, the, uh, the uh, Catholic charities in this diocese, and I think in this country, will be taking up a second collection next weekend for the victims of Hurricane Florence. So if you can remember to bring your checkbooks or uh, your wallets or purses, that would be appropriate. Thank you. May the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. May the blessing of God come upon you and go with you, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. We are renewed as one in God's word as we sing number 386, City of God. That's number 386. Awake from your slumber, arise from your sleep. A new day is dawning for all those who weep. The people in darkness have seen a great light. The Lord of our longing has conquered the night. Let us fill the city of God. May our tears be turned into dancing. For the Lord, the light and the love has turned the night into day. We are sons of the morning, we are daughters of day. 